Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Auto Central, South Africa's number one motoring podcast. And my name is George Mini, as usual, and joined by none other than Wandile Sishi. And in today's episode, we're going to talk about what you should never do to or in your car. And then next, we'll be joined by Lawrence Mini, and uh, Lawrence is going to unpack the 2021 BMW M4 competition. I don't know how fast this car is, but I'm keen to know. And then lastly, as usual, we'll uh, answer some of your questions, or should I say three of them Mm -hmm. at least, from our Ask Auto Trader platform, uh, Anything Car Buying and Selling. So how's it going, Wandy? Not too bad. Not too bad. It's a fresh new week. It is a race week as well, so I'm super excited to see what happens. At the time of recording, we are going to Hungary, so... Yeah, excited to see what happens. Let's see what happens in uh, race weekend with Mr. Hamilton. Um, uh, what do you think about this new um, uh, qualifying Sprints. method? The sprint. sprint qualifying. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. It's racing, so that's um, that's that's what I want to see. I want to see more racing. So I'm glad that they've kind of brought this back. The last time we actually saw it before this past weekend was actually in South Africa. So mm. you know, and that was like '94 or something. So yeah, I love the new format. I think it's cool. But, you know, just like that, I want to invite you all to give us a comment with regards to what you think about the new format, the new show. And of course, if you're watching the feed, subscribe and then, you know, hit the bell icon. Definitely hit the bell icon and you can get every episode uh, as it as it happens. So let's get straight into what you should never do to or in your car. Um, so in your opinion, uh, Wendy, have you ever done some dumb things in your car? I have done a few dumb things in and outside of my car. Some PG-13, others, uh, you know, not so PG-13. But um, the number one thing I think people should never do to their car or in their car is texting and driving. For sure. Yep. That is my number one pick. Uh, I don't know how you feel is the worst thing to do or some of the things that you shouldn't do. Definitely texting and driving. I mean, I, did, I, I didn't have that at the top of my mind when we came into this, but uh, definitely texting yeah. and driving. I think that's probably one of the worst uh, and most dangerous things to do is text and drive. Don't do it. Uh, it's just dangerous. Yeah. It's a dumb thing to do. You know, if you text and drive, you'll know who you are. You'll know that you're listening. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and just don't do it. You're putting everyone's life in danger, including yourself. Like a stupid yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely texting and driving. But... Um, you know, modern cars have a lot of safety features, and I think people rely on those safety features a little bit too much. Uh, you know, computers and yeah. in emergency braking and lane keep assist. And, uh, you know, I, I, I went down to Bloemfontein a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I hardly touched my... Uh, my accelerator pedal and um, mm-hmm. and and all I had to do was keep two fingers on my steering wheel and the car literally drove most of Doing the rest, way yeah. to Bloemfontein. Uh, and then you get these videos of Tesla drivers falling asleep and sleeping in the passenger seat. It's just stupid things. But, uh, uh, but with the safety features that exist today, um, yep. more and more people, it's easier to get distracted, kind of s- to them, yeah. especially on your phone, so- right? So I think one of the biggest things is I think there's a lot of things that people currently do um, or, you know, kind of subconsciously do and not realize how impactful they are to the health of their car um, and to their car experience as a whole. So that's what I'm really want to, you know, get into some of the things that I've thought to myself, but never had the courage to ask. Yeah. So uh, I'm, you know, pushing the off button. While you're driving? you're driving, yes. has anybody ever tried that? I've thought about it. You've thought about I, doing I've it. I've definitely, I've thought about what happens if I had to do it because my car actually does have a push to start button, um, and my assumption is that if I did do it, nothing would happen whilst I'm driving. But I'm just too too afraid too to, to, to find out. Don't so, do, do you actually know what happens? Well, apparently, uh, you know, the safety features of most cars won't allow you to do it. So. Um, yeah. You know, it's the, the electronics of the car just disable the, the off button while the car is in motion. Um, so, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I don't encourage anybody to try and do it. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, you know what I have done when I had my Land Rover is yeah. sometimes it's got the dial that you, you twist to go from uh, park to... Changing gears, yeah. To park to reverse to neutral to drive, um, you know. So it's got that dial, right? Which is very, mm. which is totally electronic. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, drive-by-wire type uh, mechanism. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and what I have done on occasion is um, when I'm reversing, instead of turning to drive, I turn to park, and the car's moving slightly, mm-hmm. and it locks up, yeah. 
and just stops. I've I've always thought about those systems if that would ever happen because like having a you know kind of like a, a functional gear lever I think is it's easier to not make a mistake. And I've seen now with the new Teslas, for instance, on the new steering wheel, the, the new yoke system, a lot of people are complaining the, at that, that exact thing is that now all the buttons are touch sensitive, including changing, you know, what gear you're in, everything. So you kind of make those mistakes now, but, you know, I've always wondered how impactful it is to safety. Well, um, you know, if you touch a button by mistake, I suppose, as long as it's not going to affect the trajectory or direction of the car, then uh, then you're fine, or like putting yeah. it in park or something. But I know what you mean. I've, I've watched a few a few videos on uh, the, the, the lack of tactile buttons on on the latest yeah, cars. Yeah. And, uh, and that's part of the problem is uh, uh, people are used to the tactile nature. The button sticks out or it, it's got a physical like, click that it has to happen. Whereas with the new buttons, it's really just almost like a touch screen. Um, where you just have to yeah, touch it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my, my Jaguar I-Pace is the same. It's, uh, um, there are tactile buttons which are, um, 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 you know, in and around the screens, but they're very few and far between. Yeah. Even, the, even the phone answer button, it's a physical button, but it's a piece of glass, which is very cool okay. to, 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 to push, but you've got to push it. Does it actually like move? Does it feel like yeah. it's moving? No, though? you have to like, move does it. Does it feel... It's, um, mm. But it is a piece okay. of. It looks like a, it feels like a piece of glass or or, or or high quality plastic. So another thing that has been highlighted is something that you should never do with your car or in your cars have too many keys, your ignition key. Uh, so I think a lot of cars now just push to start. But if you have too many keys on your keys, and I know a few people uh, who actually do this, it does start to damage the inside of where you put in where you put in um, the ignition starter. Um, so try avoid to not have too many keys on your ignition key, or else it is going to start damaging that. It, it, so I mean, if you look at a, if you look at a car key, and this doesn't exist today too much because of the push to start and the key fobs, but if you yeah, put the key, key fobs, in, yeah. uh, in 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 the ignition, or if you put, take the key out, you'll see it's got those like looks like teeth. Uh, mm. And what you're talking about is as the keys swing, so it kind of swing. rubs. Uh, and then and then eventually wears the key or even the mechanism inside away. Uh, and then eventually you have to replace it. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, changing oil. Um, you know. Wh- 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 so I don't, I don't change my own oil. I actually just, my service does it. I have like a subscription service for my service plan or whatever. Um, so they do it themselves. But I know a lot of people actually do decide to change their own oil. Um, and if you don't do it, you don't realize how important it is for you to change your oil. It's very important, but it's um, also the viscosity of the oil is important. You've got to go with manufacturer standards. And uh, oil is probably one mm. of them in, in an ice vehicle anyway. Um, besides fuel, which you, you don't get really bad fuels nowadays. Some fuels are bad, but most most fuel companies have relatively you know good, uh, good quality fuel. But oil, if you put cheap mm. oil in your car, you could find that your car's internal workings uh, wear m- much quicker than uh, they normally would have. Like brand What's the importance important. of actually having oils? Is just kind of making sure everything is smooth? Is there like a specific function that it has in terms of not just functionality, but longevity? Oh, yeah, I mean, uh, what the, the, the oil is designed to reduce heat and friction. So, uh, mm. you know, metal parts are rubbing against each other on an internal, yeah. compa- internal combustion engine. I mean, if you think about it, the piston, it's got the rings around it. The rings are there to seal the cylinder. Um, and there's, <laughs> there's oil that lubricates that cylinder so that the rings can move in that cylinder. Similarly with the, uh, um, uh, with the crankshaft, the crankshaft has crank bearings on it. In between those crank bearings is the oil because it spins. Mm. Um, so the oil's there to lubricate Less cause less friction and uh, less wear on the metal parts because it's metal on metal effectively. Yeah, and this is where electric cars question. kind of win because you don't really have to have um, yeah. parts touching each other. Because it's less parts, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. Late, uh, Tesla's latest uh, uh, electric motor uh, doesn't even have any parts that touch each other. Um, it's really just kind of like magnets that uh, that push the shafts around. Mm. Like electromagnetic sort of like maglev trays, for instance, they use a similar technology where it doesn't necessarily touch, but the magnets kind of, you know, make things turn. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. The next question I have is with regards to fuel. So I've heard a few people telling me that you should never let your fuel go too low. 
And I've also heard people say that you should never fill up too much. Is that a thing? Is is there a, a, a don't do in that? Overfilling your engine with fuel or well or underfueling or letting it get too low with fuel. Um so the, I think the one thing with fuel is um if the fuel stands it can get mm. old and um What's the right word? Uh, it can, it can, it, like if you let fuel stand for a very long time, it, it almost turns to like this, it deteriorates. Like, a, like okay, a yeah, jelly type uh, substance. But that's over a very long period of time. I mean, chances of you of that happening in your car are low. So, so overfilling. There's, there's no. I don't think there's such a thing as overfilling your car, um, unless mm, the fuel's going to stand in that tank for a very, very long time. Okay, okay. So just don't let. It'll become too low, but in terms of overfilling, just, you know. I mean, on the, on the flip side, getting it, don't let it fall letting out. it too low is if there's dirt in your fuel yeah. tank that is floating on the surface, that dirt's going to get into the mm-hmm. fuel system. And uh, injectors mm-hmm. have got very, very, very fine openings, almost like a, a needle type uh, fine opening mm-hmm. where sometimes dirt can stick in there. So, uh, mm-hmm. but in modern cars, the systems are sealed. Um, you know, and you can only introduce fuel into your system through the through the nozzle. Or should I mm. say, a dirt into the system through that um, through the nozzle that we actually put, it the, put fuel in. Yeah, yeah, the nozzle. Yeah. Chances of that happening, unless the uh, the nozzle at the garage is dirty, um, mm. you can introduce it. But then there's the fuel filter after the fuel tank anyway, so that's going to filter. So there's it out. a few safety measures to ensure that nothing happens there. Yeah, yeah. So okay, well, the last question I have is. I think we, you know, we can call this the mother of no-nos. Um, is putting the wrong fuel inside your car? Do you know what happens if you put diesel into petrol and petrol into diesel engine? What actually happens? Well, I suppose uh, uh, I suppose the one is bad, the other one is worse. Um, so the one that's <laughs> the one that's bad is putting petrol into a diesel car. So so uh, um, the petrol's never going to combust, um, you know. But the the thing mm. is. Um, Putting diesel into a petrol car, that's going to cause yeah, that's more problems. Yeah, that's like a recipe that's, for disaster. That's a yeah. recipe for disaster because because diesel is effectively oil. Um, it's you know petrol is yeah. more refined, so you're going to mess up the injectors of the petrol car. You're going to mess up the filters. You're probably going to have to replace injectors. Inject, injectors can cost anywhere from eight hundred rand per injector to seven thousand rand per injector, depending on the on the car. Now, if you put yeah. diesel in a petrol engine car. The question is, will the OEM replace the parts under the warranty? I would think not. Probably not. I don't think well, I, a that's a very mistake. human error, and I don't think it's yeah. That's uh, nothing to do with the OEM. That's kind of you, yes, messing up <clears throat> royally. But but so, yeah. you know, I think the I think the point the, the 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 point is though that the um, the garage's nozzles are different sizes, and so is the the inlet. For your uh, for your car, so chances are you won't be able mm. to fit that in there anyway. So uh, so yes, you, if you put petrol in a diesel car, it won't combust, but you can still drain it, and the car more than likely okay. work because the fuel's more refined. But the part where you're going to find damage is if you put diesel in a petrol car. Um, you're going to clog Just up the system. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. And here's another one that uh, I thought was quite funny. Um, uh, you know, one of our colleagues uh, told us a story of. Um, somebody that uh, phoned their uh, their their son or daughter and said, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the car seems to be like overheating or something, and um, what should yeah. what should they do? So uh, uh, this person said um, uh, to their parent, you know, you just probably need to fill up the the water. So uh, uh, they they stopped, opened the bonnet, opened up the oil cap, and put water yeah. inside the oil cap. Know that one. I've had to do the exact same thing. I had to go first somebody who did the exact same thing. Um, and it was a mess. It's a serious, serious problem when you no, do that. No, no. You, you, you properly mess up mistake. your car. You know. So, so here's the mm. principle. Oil caps are always black. Mm. Okay. Windscreen washer, uh, windscreen washer caps usually are usually blue. yellow or blue. And uh, uh, the water reservoir cap, and this is where the conundrum comes in, because I've seen them in black which means that they could resemble yeah, we'll uh, water and oil cap. Some of them are like a brown color. Um, but most of them, most of the oil caps have an oil sign on them. 
and most of the water caps have a water sign on them. So you can see the difference. If in doubt, just don't do it. Or just check your manual. Manuals will tell you exactly where to find it and what symbol to look out for. And you'll know exactly where to put your oil and where to put your water. Exactly. <clears throat> and then I suppose, lastly, don't forget to engage park before getting out of the car. <laughs> yeah. It seems simple enough, but a lot of people make that mistake as well. You know, you'll just see a car rolling and then you'll realize, oh, snap. Even it's at very park. slow speeds, you'll battle to catch and stop that vehicle. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. So if you're driving an automatic car, make sure it's in park before you actually get out of the car. You know, you don't want to knock anyone yeah. over. Exactly. Or crash a car. Yeah, exactly. And uh, on that note, let's uh, get our expert journalist, uh, Lawrence Minnie, no relation, um, but part of the Auto Trader family. Uh, Lawrence is one of our expert journalists and um, uh, writes uh, and uh, produces videos on all things car related. He's, you know, he's got one of these fortunate jobs of um, driving a car for a living, not in the taxi tour sort of sense, but in the funner sort of sense. How's it, Lawrence? <laughs> Howdy, George. How's it going? Hey, how's it going? All good, all good. Good stuff. Well, Lawrence, uh, the 2021 BMW M4 competition. Um, now, I mean, it sounds like a fast car, uh, just M4 competition. What, what does M4 yeah. competition mean? Where did BMW come up with this concept of competition? And <laughs> there's a lot of M's around, M1, M2, M3, M4, M5. It sounds like a freaking highway system. All right, so your M series cars um, are the performance uh, side of things. So there's a couple of different tiers there. You get M Sport, which is the cosmetic package. Then you yeah. get the M cars, which are the performance and cosmetic package, usually the ones that everybody drools over. Oh, that's They're interesting because I didn't realize that the M Sport was not an M vehicle. Yeah, mm -hmm. they basically, they just stick all the badging on it and, and it maybe gets a big brake upgrade or a nice fancy set of wheels or some stick on tat that goes on the side. That's That really doesn't have much to do with the performance of the vehicle. Oh. Um, when they do the bigger engines and twin turbos and bigger brakes and suspension modifications, that's when it becomes an M car. When BMW lose their minds, that's when you get an M competition. So that's where they've now tweaked the car um, and made it even crazier to drive. Yeah. And then on the other side of that, you get the CS and CSL versions, which mm. we haven't really seen many of those as of late. But yeah, the BMW M4 competition. So 375 kilowatts, um, 650 Newton meters straight to the rear wheels, no questions asked. Um, yeah. This car, when, when, one day in your car, you drive a yeah. BMW. Yeah, so. I drive a BMW, and I've been anticipating this review for a long time, Lawrence, for like a year, In actually. your car, you yeah. have eco, normal, sport, comfort, individual. Mm, sport plus, whatever. yeah. Okay. This car only has three settings, road, race, and track. You don't okay. get any other options. And ra race, race isn't road. R for reverse, right? No, definitely <laughs> not. So uh, the, uh, the first one uh, option is road. So yeah. um, still all the power is going to the rear wheels, but the nanny systems, the traction control and all that stuff is still operating in the background, but only just because this thing struggles for rear traction at even the best of times. Mm. Um, if you were brave enough to switch it over into uh, r r the race mode, um, it basically switches off a lot of the normal safety systems, but your traction control is variable. So you can actually go and set it manually, whether you want it okay. off, off on in the middle, somewhere along those lines. If you're dumb enough to put it into a uh, track mode, <laughs> Brave it actually enough. switches all the screens in the car off because oh, you don't need to concentrate. It takes off everything. It switches off all the traction control, all the engine, it switches off everything. And the car basically becomes undrivable on the street. Um, you have to go to a racetrack, which is pretty much what I did. Um, we, uh, we chose to go and test the car uh, to the best of our abilities. Um, and we uh, decided to go and test a few of the uh, additional tech items that are added to the car. Things like a lap timer and a drift analyzer. So yeah, you can actually activate that and do a drift and then it gives you a score out of five and tells you what your angle was and all that. So it's actually a very, a very, very driver-focused car. 
And yeah. this is where I start peppering the warnings. And that is, if you have not done an advanced driving course or are not familiar with how the dynamics of a car work, you should never attempt to drive this car. And this is definitely not one for amateurs, not one for people who don't know how to handle a car. Because, like I said, even in the best of conditions, the, the, the rear tires just break traction and oh, it goes wow. around in a circle. Um, it the, is, BM, is, is this the, the, does not have an X-Drive system. No. Or the, the, so the BMW M4 competition, currently uh, available in South Africa, rear-wheel drive only. You okay. can order it with an X-Drive from overseas, but then you're going to wait a couple of months for it to come in. Um, so they really are real wheel drive only. Um, we have heard in the rumor mill that there is an M4 CSL coming next year sometime, and that's real wheel drive only, no safety systems, no door cards, nothing. It even has a roll gauge in the back. Wow. When we talk a little bit about the interior of this M4 competition, um, you get two different kinds. So you have like a luxury fitment, so it has the nice bucket race seats and you know all the leather trim everywhere this one that i had bright lava orange with carbon fiber detailing um the seats were a work of art in their own they have this amazing cutouts and um you know bolstering along the side that you can sort of get really comfortable in and um, you can actually have a look at the seat and you you just know that this thing is set up for five-point racing harnesses it's mm -hmm. it it doesn't look comfortable, but it actually is, believe it or not. Um, and if you think they look good from the front, you should see them from the back. This is full carbon fiber bucket. It really is a stunning interior. Wow. If you don't mind driving a car that looks like a sports trainer. I, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at it now and uh, images of it. It's a beautiful looking car. I mean, the kidneys are uh, questionable, but I'm, that's growing on me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, a, a beautiful, beautiful car. What, what does it do a zero to a hundred and quarter mile in? Um, I tried um, to, to do a, a one-eighth pass, um, and uh, with the traction control on, it bogged off the line. I couldn't get it to launch properly. Um, switched off the launch control, and I got about 30 meters from the line, and the car just went around in a circle. The back wheels overtook the front ones. Um, I tried turning the traction control down a bit. Um, same thing happened about three quarters of the way down the track. It just spins around. So I wasn't able to give you a time, but it is something stupid. Uh, factory tested, they say it's like three seconds. Well, uh, um, uh, I've just, uh, just, just looked it up. The estimated BMW capable uh, is uh, capable of accelerating 0 to 60 miles per hour, which is 0 to 100. Um, actually, it's not a 0 to, uh, 0 to 60 miles, which is slightly different. But 0 to 100 kilometers an hour is four seconds. Um, 3.7. 3 3.8, 0 to 60 miles per hour. Now remember, th uh, 0 to 60 miles per hour is different to 0 to 100 kilometers per hour. There's a couple of kilometer, yeah. kilometers difference there. Different, so, yeah. And uh, apparently does uh, the quarter mile in 11.9 seconds. So still not as... Uh, you know what I learned the other day? Is that um, if you take a car to a drag strip and it can do zero, if it can do the quarter mile in under 10 seconds... <clears throat> it is legally required to have a parachute. Well, if you're is that in South Africa, or is that um, um, yeah, uh, isn't, it's I America, obviously, racing. but uh, uh, yeah, it must if, be international. If, if, if you're racing, if you're racing, um, a sub, I think anything sub ten seconds requires a roll cage, um, which you can basically have for the car. Okay, yes, so this now. game for competition is something else. Um, once again, if we're talking about the score. Because I know what you're going to ask me. I know you yeah, asked me before nice. we uh, we started, and I said initially I was going to give it a seven, but on on reflection and going back through my notes, and I, I'm I'm going to lean towards an eight. Um, it would score higher, but uh, once again, the price is a, a limiting factor, and then of course the fact that you actually have to know what you're doing if you're going to buy one of these. Beautiful. I love cars that are untamed. Absolutely untamed. I mean, uh, the new Tesla Model S Plaid does a quarter mile mm. in under 10 seconds and doesn't require a roll cage and a, and a parachute. Um, well, not in itself anyway, but uh, I wonder what the drag strip uh, um, uh, laws are going to change to. So uh, M4 competition, beautiful car, can probably sit next to my EV. Um, 
<laughs> robot to robot. Uh, it, it gets the pass. I might it gets the pass. It's, it's going to cost round about the same if you <laughs> if you look at the pricing. Uh, pricing on the M4 comp, 1.959 mil mm-hmm. um, without yeah. options. So, yeah, it's right up there with your Jag I-Pace, George. Yeah, in terms of speed anyway, and uh, mine's four-wheel drive. So, uh, so oh, well, you know what? They've had to put a lot into this M4 to beat the EVs or to or to at least stay <laughs> with the EVs. Um, no, beautiful car. I've, I've always loved the uh, the M-series uh, cars. And uh, uh, thanks, Lawrence. That's a score of eight, which uh, puts it up there with the Land Cruiser Prado. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, and it's the actually... E- um E Golf, the four series, the four series just got an eight point five. So, and you know, also the Porsche Taycan. Of this car. Yeah, um, you, know? you know the Porsche Taycan's up there as well. You were saying, uh, uh, Wendy, the ability. I think the the everyday drivability is the reason why it doesn't score as high as its three series or the four series counterparts. Um, mm-hmm. But I was expecting around there, anyways. So yeah, yeah. I mean, the things that beat it have been the Mercedes Benz AMG. Uh, A-Class 835, um, which is a lot slower. Um, but, uh, you know, I suppose the category that this car is in also makes a big difference in terms of where it uh, where it falls. Uh, where it falls, Because the Porsche Taycan got an 8, which is the base level model. What other uh, performance cars have we got on this list that we've done so far? Yeah, 835. Um, I mean, at the, you know, some of the cars that are a little bit lower is the 235i, which is still our least uh ranked car um so yeah i think it's doing kind of right in the middle of these performance vehicles yeah Um, but you have to think about drivability every day exactly well thank you very much lawrence if you want to go and read more about uh all things uh, car related uh, opinions um, uh, testing uh, and our expert journalists like lawrence mini you can go read all about it on autotrader.co.za and go navigate to the news and review section you will go and uh, read about the m4 competition is the is the article up uh, lawrence uh, the video will be going up sometime later this week. Um, so, yeah, you'll get to see me doing a little bit of slideways, sidey, sidey Lovely. Uh, action. And, uh, yeah, Wandi, that's another one for your list of things not to do in a car, and that's turn off the safety systems. Yo, oh, yeah. Definitely. Exactly, definitely. exactly. Thanks, Lawrence. Appreciate that. And uh, we will see Lawrence Mini uh, next time. Cheers, Lawrence. Okay, what do you think? M4 on your bucket list of uh, cars, Wandi? Uh, M3 or M2 on my bucket list. It used to be at the top, but now I think the M2 or the M3 is is uh, my cup of tea. M2 or M3, your cup of tea. Oh, this M4 sounds exciting. I think it sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it seems a bit crazy, though. Oh. It, seems, it seems like it's trying to kill trying you. Trying to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you yeah. get in, like... Rrr. <laughs> yeah. let's go you know all license uh, just to drive it well anyway any everyday people send auto trader motoring related questions all things car buying yeah. and selling and so Wendy and I will attempt to answer some of those burning questions from our ask auto trader platform so Wendy what's the first question first question comes from uh, Volt who's asking I've been using 93 on a Fiesta 2006 year model I discovered in the manual I should use a 95 will it harm if I change to the 95 from the 93 that, he, that he's been using uh, the short answer, Vault, is that the, uh, is, is no. You won't harm anything if you change from 93 to 95 now. In fact, uh, uh, you may slow down possible damage that may have resulted from using 93 so far, especially if the manufacturer says use 95. Um, so uh, definitely move to 95 if uh, that's what the manual says you should use. And uh, an easy way to determine yeah. which fuel a car prefers is uh, the engine's control unit um, makes decisions on, uh, you know, the, the advanced or the retarding nature of the um, uh, the combustion system. So uh, mm. uh, if you've been running 93 octane for a while, you should have a good idea of what your car's fuel consumption is in 93 now. And now drive it on 95 and see if the fuel consumption gets uh, better or worse. But uh, at the end of the day, if the manual says 95, switch to 95 sooner rather than later. Next question, Wadi. Next question comes from Snoopy, who's asked, well, it's kind of a long-winded question, but essentially uh, they bought a car um, and after about two months they found that there were some hidden defects. Now, an investigation was noticed that the vehicle was in some sort of accident um, where some of the panel work was redone and things were tampered with, or tampered with, such as the airbag and some of the wiring. Um, and the dealer failed to address these concerns, so they've kind of logged a complaint with uh, the Umbots and was given 
10 days kind of response to what was happened, all the dealership. But the dealership has not responded. So they're asking how do they deal with this problem now because they have identified that there's an issue, but they feel like they're being kind of cheated. Well, um, Snoopy, uh, and I'm wondering if that's your real name or your uh, internet name. Uh, uh, Snoopy, according to the Consumer Protection Act, you have about six months, or no, you have exactly six months, in which to report defects on a vehicle for uh, what we call the three R's. So the dealer has the choice to either repair, replace, or Mm. refund. They don't have to refund or replace. They can decide to repair. So you being in the two-month period puts you in that six-month time frame and uh, in an advantage. So uh, we'd suggest uh, getting legal assistance. Um, and uh, if the ombudsman is not uh, helping you, uh, you know, get uh, get some legal advice on the matter. Mm. And uh, uh, also notify your financial services provider, the person, that, the, 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 the company that you, you finance the car through, and um, uh, find out uh, whether there's any advice that they can give you. And um, you yeah. know, try and carry the case forward. Don't just leave it. Yeah, definitely. I think the speaking to a financial provider can help you a lot because they do have a little bit more legs um, and teams to kind of deal with this because they also want to protect their investment. Exactly. Um, in the vehicle. So, yeah. Okay, Next last question. question comes from Gamo who's asking, I'm earning 5K a month from a bursary and currently at school. I want a car but don't have and don't have any expenses. Is there anything that I can and do to get the car? So, uh, uh, Kamo, is provided you've got some proof of employment and you can put down a, a you know a healthy deposit, ten percent plus, um, an income of five thousand rand per month should allow you to finance a car up to a value of about one hundred and twenty five thousand rand. This will put uh, you in probably a second generation Kia Picanto, which is yep. well within your reach. The other two options are, uh, are on your list shouldn't really get too much consideration, which uh, is the Fiesta. Uh, in this price bracket, you'd have to buy a really old one, although you can go for the Fiesta if you get a really good clean one, not yeah. a bad car to go for, and uh, might have uh, you know um, some maintenance costs down the road. And uh, the new Quid is still... Uh, yeah, one of the cheapest cars. One of the cheapest say. cars, exactly. Uh, you know, and um, yeah, so I, I think you definitely at five thousand rand a month and no expenses. Your affordability sounds like you know you're keeping a lid on uh, your expenses. If you can put down a deposit, you could definitely go for a car, probably worth about one hundred twenty-five thousand rand. Noted. Noted. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for. And uh, it's been an epic episode. Uh, Thank you, Wandile Sishi. And as usual, my name is George Mini. See you next time.